Okay, here we go. My apologies to everyone. So you can continue, no Brian. Cool. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll kind of start over at the beginning again. Um, so thanks everyone for joining. Um, and thanks to Lamari and, and Diff for hosting this hackathon and giving me the opportunity to present today about um, an introduction to decentralized identity. So um, on the screen there is the trust over IP glossary definition of decentralized identity. So it's basically um, says it's a, a digital identity on the, you know, on the computer, on the internet, on our uh, phones and everything where I can um, establish control over my own keys and in a digital wallet hold, hold different data that I'm able to kind of prove is mine. Um, and it's not dependent on any external identity provider like Facebook or Google or anything like that. Um, I'm the kind of the sole person in control of all of this. And um, yeah. So um, yeah, I'll give a bit of background about myself. Um, I founded my company, Aviary Tech, uh, 2018, focusing on um, decentralized identity and trying to solve some of the privacy problems on the internet and um, make it kind of better for us moving forward into the, into the world, you know. Um, the, the digital realm wasn't going anywhere, so we might as well make it sure it's secure and um, works for us. So you might have also heard of the term uh, self-sovereign identity in when you've been maybe looking into this space. Um, so decentralized identity and self-sovereign identity are kind of go hand in hand. They're kind of two definitions of the same thing. Um, so uh, Drummond Reed wrote a really good book on the topic with, along with a few other people. Um, it's on the, on the screen there. So it's a uh, line copies right over there. It's self-sovereign identity. And it's kind of a bit of a rundown of at that moment, all of the things that were kind of going on. Um, obviously things are rapidly evolving and changing and stuff. So it's, it's a good um, base, base to start at though. So uh, the term self-sovereign identity was coined by uh, a guy, Christopher Allen, many years ago. Um, and basically he's, he brought 10 guiding principles um, to the world. He said in self-sovereign system, self-sovereign identity, um, users should have independent existence. They should be able to um, be, be themselves, uh, have their own identity and not be reliant on any other third parties or, or anyone else. And they should also have control over those identities. So they should be able to prove that they are who they say they are and, and um, do that in a digital way using um, cryptography and, and fancy stuff like that. And also they should have access to, to their own data. Um, so they shouldn't be reliant on um, going onto Facebook servers to download all the data that they want. They should always just have um, access to it. So another one, the next one is transparency. So the machines and the algorithms and computers and stuff that, that serve us, they need to be transparent. We need to know how they're processing our data and what they're doing with it. And also um, identity should be long lived. Uh, as long as I can still prove control and show that it's me, I, but identity should be should be valid to the world. Um, another one is portability. So the ability to move my digital identity from one wallet or one application into another one, that's really important to um, avoid being locked into one single um, wallet provider or application service kind of thing. Uh, another one is inter interoperability with the max amount of other digital systems out there. So we should try and be able to interact with as many people as possible. We shouldn't be um, limited to one set of, um, you know, one country can <laughs> talk to one system and another country talks to another. Everyone should be interoperable, ideally. Um, and then at the core of, of this is kind of consent. So basically how I interact with other people and um, I should be able to um, basically sign my... Um, my consent over and say, this is how I want my data to use, be used and stuff. Um, and then uh, the next one there, minimization. So basically I should, the systems that we build and stuff should be kind of uh, um, using the least amount of data about me as it needs to be able to do its functionality. It shouldn't be asking for, you know, my uh, social insurance number when it really doesn't need that at all. Um, and then lastly is uh, protection. So basically um, people in the digital world should have the, the same rights that they do in the, in the real world. Like um, we should be able to, yeah, assert our rights. Um, so how does this happen? How do we do this? Um, there's a, a few core um, specifications, both recommended through the W3C. Um, there's also tons of different related um, uh, you know, ways to do these things. Um, D 
dids and VCs I see on the street aren't the only ways to do these, but they're, you know, getting quite a lot of adoption. Um, so the first one, decentralized identifiers, basically this is a um, globally unique, um, you know, string that kind of signals that this is me and I'm able to prove control over that um, identifier. And then the next is um, verifiable credentials, which are basically just a, a signed data blob that has a bunch of uh, metadata and claims about me and stuff. And um, I'll go into both of these a bit later. Um, so, you know, these have been around for a few years now, four years for VCs and um, just recently for DIDs, but the yeah, concepts have been around for quite a while, but um, not many people are using these things and they, they don't, they're not, you know, ubiquitous. We don't all have these things. And, and why is that? So it turns out interoperability is hard. It's it's a difficult problem, um, especially when you're building brand new things and new, uh, you know, even new techniques for doing things and new approaches to using computers, basically. Um, so within decentralized identifiers, there's probably over 200 methods now. Um, so basically, a method is a way to show how you can do this on a certain in a, with a certain technique, you know, so like a, a web server or um, just a static key that you can um, prove control over or, a, um, you know, one-to-one -one peer um, DID, which basically allows me to show something to, or show it did to you and you can know that that's me, but, you know, I wouldn't reuse that kind of thing. Um, you could use a blockchain like Bitcoin or Ethereum and um, you can use a, a micro ledger with, um, on a web server or on carry or other static keys. There's tons of different t methods now. It's impossible to keep track. And the the, the argument on this interoperability um, kind of question here is, is the market will eventually decide, you know, like some of these methods aren't good. That's, that's the truth of it. Some of them are pretty good. Some of them could be great. It's um, kind of wait, wait and see kind of thing and, and see what the market adopts. Um, but, you know, the, the did, core specification, which I, I see Lamar linked in the, in the chat there, um, it does lay out what, a standard data model, right? So at the actual data model layer, interoperability is all good. So basically you can create um, verification keys and, and um, encryption keys and stuff within these DIDs, as well as service endpoints, like basically telling people how to contact you for different services and stuff. That data model at that level is, entirely interoperable, which is is great. It opens up a lot of avenues. The next one, uh, VCs. So standardizing on a way to sign data is a, a very difficult thing that people have been doing for a very long time. Um, VCs attempts to, to do it and does it um, pretty well. However, there is tons of different formats that you can kind of look at. There can be JSON-LD, JWT. And there's newer ones like uh, Selective Disclosure, JWT. There's um, there's different formats like the non creds and ACDC. It's it gets very very um, complex once you start really digging into this this world. Um, and then on top of that, you can kind of secure this using tons and tons of different cryptography suites, right? So there's there's uh, ECDSA, EDSA, BBS plus CL signatures, RSA. There's there's tons of different ways. Um, as long as you kind of are talking the ones that the people that you're talking to um can verify and stuff though you're you're pretty all good and, and yeah so um yeah so let's start with decentralized identifiers so what are these um i kind of went into it a little bit but drummond reed su sums it up pretty well so dids are the innovation that democratizes cryptography so that everyone can use it so instead of just um you know big tech service providers being able to use cryptography this kind of allows every individual to use it within their phone um, for and hold on to those keys that that does the, some of this magic powers um so fundamentally what they are is a, they are a type of new of globally unique identifier um and they don't require any any um central service provider um like I said before, there, there's tons and tons of different methods within the, the did specification and or, that you can create within the, that framework. Um, some of them are less, you know, centralized or more centralized than others kind of thing. And there's a, a broad spectrum of, of how how decentralized these things are. Um, but the, the 
important part is that I can control this identifier and I can I can prove that using cryptography. So I can I can sign statements saying I am um, did example one, two, three, and, and you can verify that that's true. I am that did. Um, so this was recommended by W3C um, uh, the summer of last year after a bit of a, a dramatic um, entry. Uh, they kind of got a bit, it got a bit, bit um, objected by some of the big company uh, organizations like Mozilla and, um, and Google and a few others. They kind of said, this is not going to be interoperable at all. So maybe that's not a good thing. Um, there's, you know, they had a couple other um, objections, but at the end of the day, it got recommended uh, by the W3C and and now, so we, we have this um, in the specification. Uh, I see a hands up and feel free to go ask a question. Yeah, so uh, if a blockchain account is a did, um, my question is like, if it would an NFT also be a did? Um, if the, the NFT sits in my account, I can prove ownership of the account and the account has ownership of the NFT. Does that make the NFT a did? Um, not really. Um, so there's, for, first of all, there is a, a did method, I think, did NFT. So it could be. Um, there's some kind of important properties about the, um, the, the did at the end of the day. So um, you basically need to be able to resolve that it has... Um, some keys that have been set up with it and some service endpoints and stuff. That being said, like there's a way to identify that um, that NFT probably, and you can have a way to build that into the, the a, a did method or whatever. So you could have like did NFT um, whatever address to like a contract or whatever that were however that works. Fundamentally, the the did core spec says the only required property of a DID is the ID, so. Yes, it's kind of. If if there's a method that's de designed to to say this is a um a did on this network and this NFT or whatever, yeah, I would say it kind of is. Without the cryptography keys and the service endpoints, though, it yeah, obviously limits what that did can do. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thanks. All right. Um. So what what does this actually really do for you? Um. So in all of human history, there's never been a globally unique network identifier. Um, so, and especially one that an individual can actually own themselves. So what, once they do that, um, they're finally in control and, and we can truly build privacy oriented digital world. Um, it's, you know, it's a bit uh, futuristic. You have to keep look at the ways that we can change the systems that we work with. Um, but there's, you know, there is a path forward is, is how I see it. Um, so a, a DID is a digital control point. So moving the control point onto the user side away from the big tech service providers and, and other systems that we don't have any control over. Um, so we can kind of co compare what a DID looks like um, compared to some of the more traditional identifiers like that. So an email address, um, my Gmail account is not controlled by me whatsoever. The Gmail or Google controls that email address, they could just delete it if they want and say, you're, you're done, you're gone. Same with my phone number. I've had my same phone number for 20 years, but my um, telecom service provider, they could just go and be like, no, that's not your phone number anymore. That's ours again, because they are the one who controls that identifier. And then DNS is an interesting one. They 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 did quite a lot, they did quite well for what, you know, what they had at the, at the time, it was a long time ago. They were trying to make it as decentralized as possible kind of thing, but um, at the end of the day, you needed some, some servers and, and stuff to resolve to domain names so that everyone can kind of understand where things are on the internet. Um, so Simon in the, in the chat says, it's worth noting you can own multiple DIDs and choose which you use with which third party, and that's totally right. So you could have you could have a new DID for every single interaction you, um, you have ever, um, if you wanted. Um, and then, uh, sorry, another question. I mean, DID is one of the core concepts of Web5. How deep do you think DIDs are going to evolve in the future? Um, I think that they're extremely powerful. Like I was telling before, I think that they're going to change quite a lot. And we're going to see, um, I don't think the best did method has been created yet. I think that they'll continue to be more and more advancements and, and get closer to the ideal properties that we, we want kind of thing. Um, that's 
what we want. We want the control point moved back to the users. We want to be able to own and prove ownership over our identifiers. So I want my um, identifiers to be, yeah, on my device and in my um, applications. Um, so this here is kind of the, the, the triangle behind how DIDs work. Um, so basically on the top, there's the DID, the identifier, and that never changes. It, it's a, a persistent identifier that you can change the underlying um, keys and service point endpoints behind the, that DIT, but the actual um, identifier is um, the same over all of time. Kind of thing. Um, yeah, so then I can prove control over that DID, like I said before. So this is kind of what a, a DID looks like. Um, this is not a, a real method. This is not an example method. So at the beginning, basically, you have the DID, the, the scheme. So basically, that's on the um, computers and stuff that this is a did. Um, next is the method. So there's um, an example in this, this method. You could have um, a key as the method, or you could have a did web as the method, or there's tons and tons of different methods, like I said before, over 200 of them. Uh, and then there's the, the method specific identifier, which is um, within that namespace, that example of namespace, I am one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, exactly. So that's that's the way to kind of look at these things. That's what they kind of look like. Um, and so I, I do have a few more slides here that kind of get a bit more technical and stuff, but I think I'll try and skip through them and, and move on to um, um, verifiable credentials. And then we can kind of go back to them if, if we're interested. So what are verifiable credentials? Um, Timothy Ruff, uh, I'm, I'm a very influential person in the space, they, he says, verifiable credentials are a shipping container for data. And so he kind of means this on a, a couple of different levels. So they are quite analogous to the to the, um, the shipping containers that you see in the world where basically it's this big box that you put your stuff in, you lock the door, you you know write some stuff on the side about it and stuff, and then you can go and send it off somewhere and, and that someone else can kind of open that and they get that contents of that container kind of thing. They understand what's what's in there and everything like that. So that's, you know, that's what he's saying there. But also he, he, he wants to point out that like the way the shipping container changed the world was pretty dramatic. You're suddenly able to ship a car to the other side of the world and, and you know, expect it to get there, um, which is before, before shipping containers, we weren't just shipping everything around the world whenever we want. You can just buy things from the other side of the um, world at a, on a whim kind of thing. Um, and that's kind of what verifiable credentials are, are able to bring into the world as well. Um, you were able to put your data inside of these um, credentials and and ship them off and show them to other people and, and use them how, we, how you see please. And um, that's pretty powerful. Um, so yeah, so a VC is basically a standard way to express um, credentials and, and claims and stuff um, on, the, on the web and further than that in real life and, you know, just in the world. Um, and they use pretty, you know, cryptography to, to make this possible. The, um, basically, if, if there's like, you know, say a university that wants to issue you a verified credential, they use their um, their own signing key and, and sign that data. And then you're able, um, the holder of that verified credential is able to present it to someone else. And the, the, that someone else, that third party is able to verify it without ever, you know, having to talk back to the issuer and say, hey, is this, is this all good? Um, they don't have to do that in this um, uh, architecture. Um, so they are also, you know, because of that, they're privacy preserving. They um, they allow me to present my credentials to to Lamari, and she, you know, doesn't have to um, talk to other people to, to kind of verify that that's um, valid data kind of thing. And um, because of cryptography and how you know cool and powerful it is, they are. They're way more tamper evident and um, you can trust them a lot more than their, you know, the physical credential. Like um, if you have your degree and you could, someone could write on it and change it and the person that you're showing that to isn't, isn't able to really, you know, verify that, that it hasn't been tampered with kind of thing. Um, obviously. Yeah. Uh, so the VC specification was recommended by W3C in 2019. So, um, you know, four years ago now, um, it, things have changed quite a lot since then. Um, the 
there's now a, a V2 that's been worked on for um, the better part of this year. And I think they're expecting to kind of release that next year. So um, it'll kind of be a bit more interoperable because of all the lessons learned from the, the first version and um, adding some new features and new, you know, it's a new version, right? So it's, it's great. Um, and hopefully that comes out next year. Uh, we'll see. Um, so this this all kind of um, relies on the three party model, which is the issuer holder verifier. Um, so basically, the issuer is the one that um, first creates the package of data and signs it and gives it to the holder. The holder puts that in their wallet and says walks around or whatever, and then they want to use a service that says, "Oh, I need to see your uh, driver's license." You then are able to create a presentation as the holder and um, present that to the verifier, and the verifier can check it that it's all good and, and kind of knows this has been issued by the proper authority and oh cool, so you know how to drive. Um, and so that's the the three-party model without the verifier talking back to the issuer, everything should should work. Um, but you're probably seeing on the screen there that kind of looks like a four-party four party model. There's a, another thing there, the verifiable data registry, what is that? Um, so, this is kind of a question that's to be determined. Um, there's a lot of people now that think maybe you don't need this verifiable data registry. So what is what it is it? It's basically a public good that you're able to put your um, the, the data about the did into, and other people are able to you know read it and and um, verify that that DID is the um, at the state that you think it is. Um, so a lot of this kind of began um, by people kind of exploring blockchain identity and how that could work and stuff. Um, and it turns out a blockchain is pretty good at this. It, um, you're able to write stuff to it and other people are able to read from it and trust that it is, um, it hasn't been manipulated. It's, it's immutable data structure, right? So it's, um, it is that public good kind of thing. Um, but there's a lot of people now that think, well, like, we don't really need this. It's kind of overhead that is unnecessary. Um, turns out you can get pretty far with just hashes and, and micro ledgers and you know and that kind of thing. Um, but you know this is to be determined. There's tons of different techniques using blockchain. Tons of techniques not using blockchain. Like I said earlier, the market is kind of it's early these early days and and things are kind of rapidly kind of changing and stuff. So who knows? Okay, so what exactly are credentials and it's kind of at the at the core of it it's a, a data model with three sections um there's credential metadata so this is stuff like um like the issuer and and like who who signed this data object who um, when does it expire and when was it signed lots of other things revocation how does this credential how can it be revoked um maybe there's an image that kind of shows the credential or a way to render the method on on systems and stuff. Tons of different metadata can be kind of included in these things. There's next is the um, the claims. So this is kind of the, the, mo the important part, right? So this is what is the issuer saying about this identifier? Um, so maybe they're saying um, Brian is a alumni of my university, University of Victoria, or he's a um, got a bachelor's of computer engineering degree. This is the the you know the the core meat of the why we're doing this, right? So, yeah. And then there's also at the bottom, there's proofs. So this is the signature on, on top of that and how that works, how those um, proofs are created and stuff. There's a few different techniques, um, kind of um, one, there's different trade-offs to both. There's, you know, there's data integrity and stuff is is signing basically the um, the semantic underlying data model, a data structure. Um, so that's kind of like the what's called RDF. Um, if you've heard of that, is is the core data model that's being signed there. Whereas with the Jose, the JWT kind of world, there's basically um, a way to sign the, the bytes of the actual um, credential. So like I said, there's trade-offs to both and um, there's, you know, strong opinions in both camps and stuff. And uh, it's, it's a interesting um, uh, world, that's for sure. So um, what do you do with these credentials once you have them? Um, basically, 
uh, the, the VC specification kind of defines a, a second data model, which is very similar. It's the, the verifiable presentation. Um, so it also has its metadata and its proof, but these are more signed by the actual holders of the credentials that is um, doing the presentation. So instead of claims in this um, data model, there is other credentials. So basically you can grab all the credentials from your wallet that you want to present to someone and package them up into one presentation, which you can send over. And then, um, you know, the verifier can, can look at that and verify all of the credentials within it. And then also verify that the presentation was um, created by who, um, who these credentials are about. And then the really, you know, powerful thing that is also opened up with this, and this gets into the sort of the privacy preserving thing that I, the, you know, the reason I'm doing this, the reason a lot of people are doing this, um, basically uh, being able to kind of decide and, and declare or disclose only the information that I want to disclose uh, or that is necessary. Um, so you can imagine I can get my, my university can issue me a, a credential that has all of these, um, maybe my whole transcript, all of my grades and stuff. But really when I'm using that um, degree, I actually just want to be able to prove that I have a, a bachelor of computer engineering or maybe prove that I am tall. So basically you can disclose just the, the pertinent information and um, not reveal any of the other information and, and basically not allow um, the verifier to, to gain more information than they than you want them to. Um, so sorry. So this this topic here, um, it's often um, overpromised, underdelivered, and um, you know barely specified. But that's kind of changing recently. There's there's been approaches that people have been using for a long time, but now there's some newer approaches and stuff, and things are things are moving rapidly in this this part. Um, so I'm I'm very um, hopeful for the the next kind of year and and developing time on this this aspect of the of the ecosystem. So privacy and security are extremely important to all this. Um, it's uh, being, sorry. Um, <clears throat> once you're kind of giving this like valuable information in to the users and to the people who kind of the information is about, you yeah, then have to kind of trust them to use it, um, you know, in a, in a good way, it, like without, kind of ruining their own security without ruining their own privacy. You want to be able to allow, um, give them the tools that they need to succeed in this world without having to um, overburden them with kind of decisions like, oh, do you consent to this this share and this share? And like, you don't want to be bothering the user that much because if you keep bothering them, they'll just, you know, start accepting all kind of thing, which is what we kind of do with, with those cookie pop-ups right now, right? Like, so it's, there's a, a balance there and um, there's lots of other, privacy and security risks and stuff. Um, so if you get deep into this, you, you kind of have to um, worry about this kind of thing. Um, so I see a question, question there. Does, does selective disclosure require that an issuer creates many verifiable credentials with individual claims? For example, if I want to use my uh, driver's license to prove that I'm over 21, but I don't want to reveal my name, how do I do that? So no, it does not require um, many VCs. Um, there is some more advanced cryptography that the issuers could be using. Um, so um, there's one approach called uh, BBS plus signatures, which is um, a powerful one. What it does is it basically uses group messaging to sign individual um, claims within the credential. And then what you present is actually a um, derived proof from the, the original credential of just the um, the, the claims that you want to reveal. And um, this is basically proof of knowledge of a signature and uh, there's some advanced things that I don't quite understand how they work. Um, but there's, yeah, there's, so there's a few other um, similar schemes. Some of them use less advanced cryptography, like they just kind of use um, salted hashes or whatever. And then you can kind of prove that a, um, a hash is a, is a value because you have the, the salt that you can reveal to someone. Lots of different approaches like that, but at like what you, um, Austin, what you did mention there, um, that is a valid approach, like that has been done in, in some ecosystems and stuff. Basically, if you get issued a credential that says you're over 21, and then you can go around and 
present that credential and show that you're over 21. And so it it is possible using a few techniques. That's one of them. Um, that you know, that's not really the most performant and, and the best user experience because you have all of these little I'm over 21, I'm over 19. Like there's tons of credentials that you have to keep track of kind of thing. So ideally we can kind of get to a world where some of the more advanced cryptography is kind of seamless to the user and you don't have to worry about how that works at the end of the day. Um, cool. So I do have a little couple little demos here that I'd, I'd like to show you guys. Um, so the one keep wallet that I'm going to show here, a, a video I'll, I'll play. Um, this is a, a video I used for um, what was called the Jobs for the Future Plug Fest. And it was basically an interoperability event to show that, um, you know, people's digital wallets that they've been building are able to um, interoperate with the, you know, broader ecosystem and, um, um, and that kind of thing. So this uses um, a technology called Chappie. So that basically allows you to um, register your wallet within the, the browser and the browser can open your wallet for you and uh, ask you to present your credentials or issue credentials into it. Kind of thing. So at the beginning here, there's um, a presentation request kind of has been created that is asking for these three credentials and like going through them, I don't, I don't have any of these credentials. So I have to go back to this, what's called the VC playground um, and receive these credentials. I've got to get them into my wallet. So this is kind of uh, showing how that's done. Um, basically here I'm presenting an authentication saying, this is my identifier. Please give me the credential with that um, identifier. Going through and getting a, a few more of these. This is, I'm showing um, that the wallet is able to kind of use a few different techniques for um, receiving the credential and being issued the credential. Um, there is different ways to do these things, of course. And so it's uh, like I said before, a lot of those interoperability challenges are, are, uh, are fun to put. So this is the last one here. Um, this is a open badge version three that I'm about to receive. So that, um, you might have heard of open badges before. Um, the version two was kind of just a you know, static thing that you could put on your website or whatever. There was no cryptography behind it. Uh, whereas open badge v3 is totally a verifiable credential, uh, which is really cool because they'll actually be powerful and do stuff for you in the future. Okay, so here I'm going to do that same presentation request, um, ask my wallet to I need these three credentials. Can you present them to me? So this playground website obviously is a bit of a um, kind of a, just to show how things work. But you can imagine that playground would be you know a university website wants you to present all of these different credentials to. It. And there you can see the the credential was the three credentials were presented um, obviously that's just a bunch of ugly data but you could after that the um, website could kind of kick off and do some some fancier stuff um so i do have like i could do some more um actual manual demos with, with the VC Playground. Um, so this is created by a company, Digital Bazaar, um, who I've been working with. Um, so I helped them build some of the later, latest functionality in that Playground. Um, but um, maybe we'll kind of get to that if we if we have time. Um, so thanks, Lomari, uh, for letting me speak about this. It's one of my topics I'm passionate about, of course. Um, and I'm, I'm excited to see what you guys kind of produce for this hackathon. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be, you know, you have a, a full month to work on things, which is, which is really cool. You can probably build some some really cool stuff, and I'm really excited to see kind of what people do. Um, please do feel free to, you know, reach out to me if you have any questions or if you, um, you know, just want it, uh, a perspective on the what's going on in decentralized identity. It's, um, I'm always happy to answer questions and things. Um, so, yeah, I... I open up to questions or I can go and go through and demo some more things if you want or yeah. 
Yeah, why don't we see if there's any questions from any of the attendees? You can ask in the chat or, okay. Go ahead, Austin. Um, you can ask in a chat or you can go ahead and just um, ask in Zoom. And while he's getting his question uh, together, I will, I'm just gonna drop the Discord server in here. If you haven't been to our Discord for the hackathon, this is a good place to ask questions as well. And so um, Brian will will be around, a lot of the other people in the community will be around. Um, mm -hmm. So we have a uh, we have a support channel. So if you're totally, lo totally lost, or if um, you have a specific question for one of the prize challenges, there's a challenge for each one of those as well. Brian, um, would you mind uh, mentioning a couple of the options? You said there are many options for um, selective disclosure uh, to, to work with that. I wanna, I wanna see if I can incorporate that in my, mm -hmm. uh, protocol so what are, what are some good ones that you would recommend yeah okay so um it's like i said it's early um so i'll i'll, I'll tell you the kind of history of the things that how i know them um so there's there's a this this part called um this technique or you know ecosystem called basically a non-creds which i mentioned earlier um so it's from hyperledger which is um a linux foundation kind of um subsidiary and there's a project called Hyperledger Aries that kind of birthed this stuff, or actually Hyperledger Indy. So Indy is a, a identity network. Um, and basically they created this way of you can put like um, credential definitions and schemas on this ledger, as well as the, um, like I said before, the dids and stuff. Anyways, so they've there's a, a format on, that uses all that infrastructure called um, an on creds that uses what's called CL signatures. And so um, they've been able, you've been able to do that, that selective disclosure stuff in that kind of ecosystem for quite a number of years now. The it's the thing is, it's not kind of broadly interoperable. So it's, it's a bit of a um, siloed kind of uh, world, but then there's um, newer approaches. There's um, the BVS plus that I, I think I mentioned, um, they, the techniques and stuff for that have been kind of around for a couple of, a couple of years as well, but the, cryptography behind it needs to kind of really be standardized and stuff. So that's being done at the IETF. Um, and that, that's kind of almost reaching its um, conclusion there. So that once that's kind of, you know, finally fin finalized and standardized, then you can kind of bring that um, crypto stuff into the, um, to the verifiable credentials world and cr create, you know, crypto suites and stuff that, that, um, that uses that. So um, there's a, a, uh, within the VC two working uh, uh, working group, there's a um, a technique for that VBS plus using um, data integrity. So that's very early, but that's coming on, coming out soon. Um, and then there's also uh, what's called SD Jot, which is um, allows basically it's, it's basically an extension on um, JWTs. So if you know what J JWTs are, it basically allows you to have a JWT that has um, all of the data in it is hashes, right? So there isn't actually the core data in there, but then when you go and present it, you can kind of reveal the data that you're, that correlates with that. And it's, you know, cryptographically provable. There's also um, something I didn't even mention all of this before is there's an ISO standard um, mobile driver's license, um, MDL. So that's a whole other ecosystem and world and stuff. And within there, they they have similar to the salt attach um, uh sector disclosure stuff um yeah so hopefully that, that helps um i know it's it's not kind of the best answer because i can't really point you to one thing to go look at and do and stuff but um like i said it's it's early days for that kind of stuff yeah yeah thank you that helps yeah no worries. um okay so austin says do you imagine that the ids will be used for authentication I've heard the argument that decentralized identity and VCs will prevent centralized attacks where attackers leak customer data from a database. But if a company decides to store customers VCs in their database, they're still vulnerable to that type of attack. What are your thoughts on this? How should verifiers retroactively access customer information after they initially present their credentials? 
Yeah, that's a really good question. So um, what's really important here is like, um, we're kind of trying to move the ball forward to a new paradigm where um, if you re receive some data about someone and they didn't present it to you, you don't really trust it or whatever. Like you can, you can get other people, you can get the information and data and stuff from all these different sources and stuff, but it's not as um, basically valuable to the, to the, um, to the people without that kind of cryptographic digital signature on it. So it's being proving the, you know, the it's not being replayed and stuff. Um, so basically trying to shift the, the, um, the world into that kind of thing, a world where like that data is less valuable to the, um, you know, the black markets and stuff. That's kind of what we're hoping for here. Um, but like, like you said, like, um, verifiers could just be stuffing all these VCs into their database and go and selling that, that data again. Totally. I mean, like that once you present data to someone, they can do whatever they want with it. Well, uh, technically, but not maybe legally. So we're trying to move the ball into towards a world where the legalities of the sharing that kind of data is, is different. And, um, yeah. So hopefully that answered your question, uh, Austin. Um, but. Um, oh, sorry. The beginning of the question: Do you imagine the VCs could be used for authentication? Um, totally. So they're not the best thing to you to use for authentication because you know um, you are kind of re revealing a bit of information about. Or I guess I'm talking about um, VCs, but DIDs definitely can be used for authentication. Like they're you're pr proving control over that DID, um, right? So uh, in my demo there, you saw at the beginning the first thing I did was an authentication step. So I. I basically I signed a challenge saying, "This is my did. This is me." Um, let's take the example of driver's license. What would be the process in the case of a DUI? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> I've never kind of really thought about this, but so let's work through it. Um, so say I have a, a driver's license and I'm caught by a, um, uh, you know, the law enforcement in my area under the influence. And they give me a, a DUI. Basically, that DUI could be kind of a a, a bad. Uh, what's that? I heard the term. Um, I forget right now. But a bad claim, like a claim that's about me that you know it, it isn't what I want to be presenting to people. But that doesn't mean they can't make the claim about me. So they can go and create a VC and then put it into their own um, law enforcement database or whatever. And then the next time a, a cop see, pulls me over or whatever and looks up my driver's license and he looks at his own law enforcement database and says, oh, you got a, a DUI last month, right? So that's the the VCs and stuff, the way I've described them so far, you know, you're basically giving the control to the user and giving that data to them, but also people can be making claims about you that you don't have control over. Um, so. We just the, built uh, a, a little feature for that on a social um on a decentralized social network and we called it a ding so uh -huh. a positive one was, was a kudo and a negative one was a ding <laughs> oh yeah yeah i like that that's cool um yes and sorry yeah of course so revocation is very important there um like the, 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 the or suspension more likely um the law enforcement agency would probably be talk talk up to their higher ups or whatever systems and someone at the end of the day would kind of revoke that driver's license and the driver's license wouldn't be valid, you know, the next time they get pulled over or whatever, that kind of thing. So there's, you know, a few different things that kind of have to happen here. Um, yeah, so you you would need a new one to, to be able to prove that you are legally able to drive. Um, yeah, that, so the, the ding thing that you, you mentioned there, that's, that's interesting. So I know that, like, like the Facebook and stuff, they only have a like button. They don't have a dislike button. And that's kind of for a, a valid reason, right? Like they don't want people to just go and bully people on the internet. Just, well, obviously they do using Facebook anyways, but there's using having just like a download button is, is kind of like detrimental to the, the users on the other side. So there's, there's all these trade-offs and stuff. And um, of course, yeah. 
Any other questions? Cool. Right. Um, yeah, so please do feel free to reach out at any time. Um, that's my email there. Uh, I'm on uh, Twitter or X or whatever and, and GitHub. I have lots of open source stuff uh, available on, on GitHub. And you can find either me, Brian, or whatever, or my company is Aviary Tech. Um, yeah, so Simon, so um, let me actually show that. Sorry. So within the VC Playground, um, I've got my uh, wallet here as a, a demo wallet kind of thing. So you can go there and you can play with it yourself. Um, I did make it so that it, after an hour, it's supposed to delete itself. I think that there might be a bug and it's not doing that anymore, but it's supposed to just wipe its contents clean every hour kind of thing. So that people don't actually start using this for what and then like expect me to um you know help them recover their credentials and stuff if they lose them um so like i said you can go play with that on 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 there um if you go to the vcplayground.org um that's what this is and then, so there's an issue or demo and the verifier um you go into the setting and there's a few different um um, ways to issue credentials and, and stuff as well as the same with the verification side um the what might catch people a little bit is like if you change this to vc api is more often going to work with i'd say more wallets or um more mobile wallets for sure i think one keep is currently set up to only work with um vc api and um this other one it doesn't work with the browser to web so that's a little gotcha um But yeah, I could I could go through and kind of show you how this basically you can go. This is um the wallet selector within what's called Chappie. Um it kind of opens up the wallet for you. Um and this works on, on mobile as well. You can go ahead and sign over top of my um identifier, proof that it's me, and accept this credential. And now it's in my wallet. Oh, that's not the one, but yeah. Um, are there standard protocols for sites to interact with ID wallets? Yeah, sort of. So um, what I showed here is what's called Chappie. Um, and so that uses, um, it's basically a polyfill that allows you to um, get this screen here that's asking you to select your wallet because there's nothing built into browsers for this stuff yet. That is kind of in the works and moving and happening and stuff. Um, I was I heard of a session recently by the Google Chrome team. And so they're, they're working on it and who sees what, who knows what Apple will do on this avenue. Um, yeah, so that's um, that's one way. There's also um, this other ecosystem called the OpenID for verifiable credentials. And so they kind of have their, uh, another set of pr protocols. Um, some of them like, can be used over VC API. So this one here that I showed you OID for VCI, that's what that is. And so it's another sort of protocol. Um, you can find that at the um, OpenID Foundation. I'm sure there'll be lots of links in, in other places and stuff, but yeah. Um, there's also another protocol that I'd like to mention called uh, DIDCOM. So basically that is um, using uh, DIDs to have a encrypted channel with, with another DID. So basically I can, send a message to you and encrypt it for you. And um, once you receive it, you can decrypt it and um, you have this, um, you know, authenticable and um, encrypted message that you can be sending credentials over as well. So no one has registered any protocols yet. So do you mean um, with the browser or with um, what, what kind of uh, register with who? Um, yeah, so ID wallet is, uh, sorry, I guess I just don't really understand the question. So yeah, I guess what you're asking is kind of like crypto wallets kind of does this stuff for you already. Um, and they do, um, they allow you to kind of prove control over your crypto wallet and you can sign into a website using that or whatever. Um, and so the, the difference kind of with that world is that you're kind of, um, interacting with that service on their um, like 
whoever's built that kind of website that lets you lo log in or whatever, you're doing that there. Um, whereas with an identity wallet, you kind of want it to be on your system that you're um, presenting the credentials to the other system. So that basically there's this interoperability there that's challenging, but it's it's coming together and, and people are working on these things. One of the good approaches that I've shown you here is called Chappie Credential Handler API. Um, so if you're looking to register a, a protocol similar to a, a Web3 wallet or whatever, I, I would I would be interested in hearing what you're working on. Right All right, I'll just mention that it is on the top of the hour uh, for people who may be blocked off uh, this time and, and are moving on to other things. Um, we'll take a couple more questions because it seems like people are really excited um, and then we'll, we'll I'll uh, encourage everyone to move the discussion over to Discord. Cool, so um, Austin just asked, uh, do you think DidCom could replace HTTP? Do you envision a world where communication on the internet happens exclusively with DidCom? So that's an interesting question. So it's not gonna replace HTTP, I don't think, because a lot of DidCom uses HTTP at the end of the day. So um, the DidCom specification doesn't actually, um, uh, limit a particular transport layer, it kind of allows you to, it's a, a layer away from that. So basically you can, you can do it over many different transports. So you can do it over HTTP, you can do it over um, like WebRTC, you can do it over uh, email, you can do it over um, snail mail, you can do it over anything. It's just a, a way to kind of encrypt the data and, and um, tell people how to contact you and stuff. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so interesting, another interesting part of kind of the DidCom aspect of things is there's uh, the Trusted IP that I mentioned before. Um, they're working on a specification called the Trust Spanning Protocol. So um, they're kind of um, doing something similar to what DidCom does. They, um, DidCom maybe is a bit, um, heavy handed possibly, I don't, I don't know. There's a lot of opinions in different ways, um, but what they want at this trust banning protocol layer is kind of the core tiniest, smallest little building blocks that allow you to kind of get this cryptographic trust without having to worry about the other layers on top. So on Didcom basically it kind of tells you how to structure protocols and stuff in, in Didcom world. Whereas the trust spanning protocol, really what it wants to do is kind of be is minimal as possible, but adding this cryptographic trust layer. Damari, just before I log out, uh, the next session is on the first, uh, is that right? From what we see on yes, the- Yes, that's correct. The next session that we're gonna be having is 9 a.m. Pacific time with Marcus Sabadello on Everything you want to know about DIDs, DID resolution, the universal resolver. So that's going to be next week on November 1st. So as of now, Eventbrite is um, updated until November 2nd. So is it going to keep getting updated with all the sessions? I'm sorry. Can you repeat the question one more time? Uh, I didn't. So when, uh, when uh, someone looks into Eventbrite right now, the sessions show until November 2nd, which is introduction to um, JavaScript framework. Um, so further on, is there um, are there sessions that are put up on Eventbrite yet or not yet? They're all up on Eventbrite. Um, oh. So if you go to our hackathon site and if you go under educational sessions, mm -hmm. that's where you can see all of them in one place. And I'll drop the link right there so you can yeah, just can go now. Yeah, and just grab the ticket for whatever you want to attend now. So all the sessions are there. So the one that you just uh, dropped, right? Diff Hackathon, Dev Post? Yes, that's yeah, it. Okay, yeah, that's, uh, that's good. Thank you. Awesome. All right, so we will wrap it up today. I want to thank Brian for putting together this presentation and also to all of you, the, these were some great questions. I'm really glad uh, we got to have uh, this dialogue. 
and it is recorded. Um, so you can share it with those who couldn't make it, who might be interested and feel free to continue the discussion on discord. Um, I did drop the link um, in the chat, uh, but uh, we'll be around uh, for any further questions you might have. Cool. Thanks, Mari. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thanks, Brian. All right, Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Great day. Yeah. Or night.